everyone, thanks for watching. This will be a two-part video due to the amount of material that we'll be covering. If you enjoy the content presented here in part one, stay tuned. You won't be disappointed with what follows. Before I move on to the actual science though, a couple brief announcements. First, please take a moment to check out my website, naturallegion.com, which I created to provide a blog that accompanies my videos here. Second, even though I have already bombarded the internet with two prior videos, I have yet to achieve the level of reach that I'm aiming for, but not to worry. The goals of this channel is to present you, the viewer, with nothing but high quality, informative, and entertaining material that will promote science, obliterate pseudoscience, and hopefully inspire as many out there as possible. And this just means that it's time to ramp it up. If you enjoy the work that I do here, I would greatly appreciate if you would take a moment to rate, comment, subscribe, and share. I don't get paid for any of this work, and my goals are exclusively to educate and inspire, so I rely on you, my valued viewers, to make that a possibility. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's get down to something more interesting. When there is an internal consistency in somebody's views, the prospect of stepping out, exploring as much information as possible, and challenging their values and beliefs with a critical mind is often faced with great hesitation. It is easy to be concerned that if your beliefs are scrutinized closely enough, it might lead to an unraveling. I can say this with confidence because I'm no different. For about a decade or so, from middle school to my early 20s, I was a staunch young earth creationist. I sat in the front row of the church when Kent Hovind came to speak near my hometown. I owned a subscription to Answers Magazine for years. I dragged family members to the Creation Museum in Petersburg, Kentucky whenever the opportunity came. And like many others, during long internet discussions over creationism and evolution, I would sit poised, prepared to peruse websites like the Institute for Creation Research or Answers in Genesis in search of rebuttals to the uh, evolutionist arguments that I would encounter. I was confident, no, I knew, that anyone was just plain wrong if they didn't believe the same thing that I did about the age of the earth or the history of life on earth. I felt that reading thick, heavy textbooks on biology or biochemistry or taking college classes in them would just be a waste of time. After all, I knew everything I needed to know about evolution from reading the creationist literature. They're Christians, after all. They present the topic and the information honestly, because that's the right thing to do. And if evolution is so wrong and evil anyway, the scientists who study and teach it cannot be trusted. Thanks to the comfort and the internal consistency I felt while entrenched in this view, I didn't have to study biology or evolution from non-creationist sources in order to know that they're wrong. It just made sense that they're wrong. If you're a creationist watching this, take a brief moment to perform an audit of your personal beliefs and ways of thinking. If anything I'm describing about my former self even remotely applies to you, then I urge you as you watch this, be mindful of the impulse to ignore or dismiss new information just because it might have uncomfortable implications for your current views. A number of people have already made some fantastic videos explaining biological evolution, but something I promised to come back to in a previous video, and that I believe has been largely underrepresented in public education on evolution, is the convergence of phylogenetic histories. I'll come back to this in part two, but first I'd like to dispel some misunderstandings that seem to crop up from time to time. Evolution is only a theory. Well, yes and no. Evolution is a process, it's just something that happens to wildlife. The theory of evolution is how science explains that process. In science, observations and experiments are used to collect data, and a theory is whatever the best available explanation for the data is. If new facts are discovered that cannot be explained by the theory, the theory is revised to make sure that it stays up to date with the available information. Nobody's ever observed evolution. Look at Lenski's experiments of bacteria then. So what do the bacteria become? The bacteria are still bacteria, of course. So that's not Darwinian evolution. That's not a change of kinds, is it? No one's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. Because evolution happens through incremental genetic and epigenetic modifications that build up gradually from one generation to the next, the degree of evolutionary change that we can observe directly depends a lot on factors like how many generations have passed during the course of our observation. So when you hear a creationist challenge evolution by asking for an example of change in kind, they generally want to see something that evolution doesn't actually predict. And whether they know it or not, they're objecting to a caricature of evolution, not evolution. 
the type of evolution that evolutionary biologists expect to be able to observe within a single human lifetime has indeed been observed. We've been able to document bacteria evolving new genetic functions. We've been able to document animals developing new anatomical structures in response to their environment. Instances of speciation where one species of organism splits into two have been documented. But most of these examples of evolution occur to an extent that creationists don't usually dispute. The real issue is the whole fuss about evolution in deep time. You know, common ancestry via descent with modification. Over the years, the kinds of changes that are necessary and sufficient for this level of evolution have become increasingly evident. For example, new genetic information arises through continuous modification of existing genetic sequences. Gene duplications, gene fusions, insertions, deletions, substitutions, and rearrangements of the genome via processes like exon shuffling and gene conversion have each been documented by different groups of researchers. Studying these processes helps us understand how evolution happens, but when it comes to confirming long-term evolutionary history, like the shared ancestry of all animal life, additional evidence is required, which is the main focus of this two-parter. But first, there are a few more objections that need to be dealt with. No mutation has ever been observed to increase an organism's genetic information. This is wrong. What we call genetic information is the arrangement of monomers in a nucleic acid chain such that they fulfill biological functions by specifying the production of proteins or functional RNA, or contributing to other biological processes, such as providing binding sites for proteins that control gene regulation. If a mutation occurs in a stretch of DNA that results in the production of a pre-existing protein, but with a modified biochemical function, perhaps by enabling the protein to catalyze an isomerization reaction on a new substrate, and this process was absent from the cells prior to the mutation, then the mutation has resulted in a DNA sequence that produced a molecule with a new biological function, constituting the very definition of new information. In other words, new genetic information doesn't just miraculously appear. It arises through a series of incremental modifications to already existing genetic information. Evolution doesn't explain how life got here in the first place. Of course not. Evolution describes a process that happens to life. In other words, there must already be life before it can evolve. Research on the origin of life, although not part of the theory of evolution, is something that I will cover in an upcoming video, so stay tuned. But DNA comparisons show common design, not common ancestry. Fortunately, here is where creationists leave their belief wide open to being tested. Oops. If genetic sequences only encode the morphological characteristics of an organism, then it would make sense that the more similar two organisms appear, the more similar their DNA should be. However, if different animals, like cats, squirrels, and butterflies, were created separately instead of being biologically related, any functionally identical genes that are shared between these animals should only differ due to mutations that crept up independently in each lineage. And so the same gene should exhibit sequence differences that are stochastically distributed across all animals, rather than any two animals possessing a number of commonly shared genetic mutations that is roughly proportional to their distance apart on the evolutionary tree, as common ancestry would predict, which is what we observe. More on this coming up in part two. Thank you for watching.